and welcome to UFO Secret Space, and I'm your host, Janet Kierlissen. And today we're having a panel with Jean Ann Eisenhower, Susan Johnson, and General Hendricks. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Jean Ann Eisenhower is an award-winning radio journalist, media consultant, and radical environment, environment activist who discovered at almost age 50 that she had been a mindful subject since birth. Soon she came to accept she was also an experiencer, or maybe in the UFOs, and she began publishing about her experiences. And I've got more about her on squaringradio.com. And then General Hendricks uh, works with Dracos in the German Secret Space Fleet. He's an instructor who trains the recruits, and he trains kids that want to join the special forces and off world jungle planets. And finally, Susan Johnson, she, her experiences started at age seven when she had a recurring dream of us flying a ship into the Earth's solar system and being abducted by a black hole over the Earth's upper atmosphere. Then they found her using her soul residual, residual energy and a signature, and they traced her trajectory and incarnated her into her present physical body. So this is going to be a very exciting show. I think I'm going to mute people that aren't live because I'm getting a lot of background noise. Okay, and uh, what we're going to do is um, start with each person. We're going to start with Susan, and uh, you, uh, the other two listen in so you know you learn about each other. Um, we're going to go through a brief intro of uh, who each person is, and then we're going to open a dialogue. In the dialogue part, feel free to ask questions about the previ- what the previous people said, to ask questions that will give to the whole um, group or ask specific questions. And a little bit about me, I have a lifelong experiencer. I've been in underground installations, especially the one at Johnson Atoll, which is in the Pacific, and I've had many interactions with extraterrestrials and interdimensionals and ghosts and you name it. So we're looking at the Secret Space program today and all the various ways you can be connected. Okay, let's start with Susan. Welcome to our show. Hi, Susan Johnson. Hi, uh, Janet. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to have the three of you here today. So um, keep in mind, a lot of people haven't heard your story. We're going to talk for about five to ten minutes. When you feel you're complete, uh, you can also pass the talking stick if we're going, the virtual talking stick if we're going long. So just tell us a little bit about who you are, how you identify, are you human expert, crystal hybrid, your soul essence, your physical form. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became aware of what's going on. Like you said, at the age of seven, um, I became aware that the fact that I was an alien incarnate when I remember it was a reoccurring dream of me, of us flying through the Earth's solar system, bouncing off the gravitational fields. And, and then we, when we entered in the Earth's upper atmosphere, we were in our third phase of reconversion. And that was when this black hole opened up to the right side of the ship and I woke up before the other crew members did because the other crew members were human Nyendans, not Archeron Nyendans. And I was an Archeron Nyendan hybrid in my past life. And because I'm a very specialized navigator type that flies any type of ship or anything, I was able to wake up and I saw the black hole opening up. And then the other crew members woke up um, disorientated and sluggish. And I said, Ekna, his name was Ekna, shift the mass to the black hole, not away from it. To the black hole, not away from it. And he shifted the mass to the, away away from the black hole. And when he did, that's when we got abducted. And then and then um and then I remembered the, the it was like a white area was floating around in it and a little tiny white speck. And then I was born. well. Every time I had the dream, it happened like three or four times. And this is at seven years old in 1967. And so then when I went, I was going to the private school at the time. I I went into the library and I read every book on science, physics, relativity, quantum mechanics, psychology, you name it, um, UFOs, paranormal, dream interpretation, trying to explain what was happening to me. And at that time, they had no support groups or anything like they do now. And then from there, I started going through an awakening process where they introduced me to my um, Archeron parents on the ship and everything. And most of the dream, it was all like... 
events, but I remember it later on as a dream. And, and, and then I found out later on in my life, I found out, well, just recently, since the late 1990s to the early 2000s, um, by speaking to some other people that do research into alien abductions and stuff that a lot of times they remember it later on as a dream. Mm-hmm. So then I started explaining all of this, and, and um, I, I then keep in an ongoing journal writing everything down, and I got very detailed information on the different types of missions we do, like around the sun, blocking the CMEs from hitting the Earth, balancing out central planetary energy vortices, um, stabilizing what they call planetary identity matrices, and um, the, the seeding certain alien races that do seeding, some of them will come down here and take sperm and ovum samples from humans. What they're doing is some of them are using it like for other races that have lost their planets, and they will use those material to go ahead and, and create bodies, and they put them in animated suspension, and they will take the souls of those people that were killed when the planet was lost or something, and they will reanimate those bodies on the ship with their souls, and there will be the same biomatrix that matches the soul matrix. And then we also do planet creation where we can sub- supplant those different races on the given planets where the biomatrix matches what they call the planetary identity matrix. There's a lot of different work that we're doing, but we're, we've also been fighting up there too. And, and it's a very complicated yeah. scene up there. I'm, it's worse than chess. Um, my dad, I was a nuclear contractor. I have a degree in physics, a degree in electronics, mechanical maintenance, and computer repair certifications. I'm artistic. I do gardening, and I grow organs. Wonderful. That's a great start. So um, let's hold it right there. I'm going to see if General Hendricks is ready to go. Let me turn on his mic. Hello? Aloha. Yes. Hi. Hi, Hendricks. Are you ready Hello. to go give us a brief um, description of yourself and your work, and then we'll bring on Gene, and then we'll do a round table. Go ahead, Hendricks. Tell us a little about yourself and your mission here. About your okay, mission. so what I, what I am is I am a draconian that has incarnated here since the 1870s. Um, I currently serve in the German secret space programs known as Dark Fleet. Uh, I've been a super soldier for about a couple of tours now. Now I'm, in, now I'm doing training, training new recruits that want to be in the Special Forces for the Dark Fleet. Um, how, we, how we do the Special Forces is we kidnap star seeds all over the world and at a very young age, and we bring them to this jungle planet, and we force them into the hunt. The hunt is a the design program to uh, get these kids into a scared state of mind so they show their uh, special abilities that they have. Uh, every starseed kid is unique, so they have a unique special ability. Uh, what what they do is, um, so we'll release a bunch of unknown enemies into the jungle and we'll give them a mission. We'll say, it's your job to get to the Stargate portal and then Stargate portal back to uh, German command, and if you make it through, you become a, a special forces uh, uh, soldier. So these kids will be running around the forest looking for the Stargate portal while being hunted at the same time, and they will start using their special abilities that they don't even know they have while they're being attacked by other beings. And if they don't use their special abilities, then they just get killed. Uh, but they, I know they can be regenerated, but the whole point of finding out who's going to be in special forces is the strongest will survive. So they use the strongest ones and out of 50 kids we'll test that maybe four or five will make it through the portal and back to uh, the space command. So. Wow. And I've, I've heard similar stories from other uh, secret space program super soldiers. So we'll go into that in greater depth in just a moment here. Uh, thanks for uh, Hendrix, and uh, let me pull on Jean. Hi, Jean. All right. I know your um, story is somewhat different, but what would you like to tell us about yourself? Yeah, mine is different in that I probably have the least 
um, conscious awareness of what has been going on with me. What I do know is that I was born into a family lineage that has military, Mormons, Masons, and Hollywood. And um, I was born on a very auspicious date. And um, I know that I had a very intense spiritual life as a child because my training included being left alone a lot. So I had spiritual helpers that would visit me or take me through a portal to visit them. And, um, but I never remembered anything. And when I tried to talk about it, um, my family was very upset. They did not want me to talk like this. They were calling me crazy. And, um, and so I learned to just shut up about it. And I went through most of my life as a just, a, you know, kind of going after my profession and being a mom and, um, and didn't think that I had anything too strange going on in my life. But I knew something was wrong with me. I knew that my life was not like everyone else's. And I knew that I had um, bouts of amnesia that I could not explain. And just when I would look back on my life, it felt like it was all broken up in pieces, and I couldn't explain that to anybody. And eventually I came to realize that I was a multiple personality when I was, it was in 1993, so I was 41 years old. No, 94, I was 42 years old, and then I was almost 50 before I realized I was a mind control subject and started putting together all the pieces of that. So... These experiences of having my natural um, spiritual capacities intact as a child that I could remember, and I got back into that also when I moved out to the desert to become a hermit and to pursue that. So my, I started developing my spiritual life, which is, I'd say, part of our cosmic consciousness, and, um, and things got really amazing when I lived in the desert with no radio or TV and just thought spirit um a lot of very interesting things started happening and then after i found out i was mind controlled it got pretty scary at that point so we can save that for later i think so i've been a mind control okay, subject, so which requires being multiple and then afterward i became targeted excellent okay since you went last you get you're the first one that you get to either uh, ask a question for all of us Ask a question for a specific person or give feedback or whatever for the other two people on this panel, or even me if you have any questions. So I'm going to turn on the mic. So just everybody, when you're not speaking, try to be as quiet as possible because we pick up a lot of background noise. But go ahead, Jean. What would you like to ask this group? Because we're looking for how we can connect the dots and figure out this mystery. Right. Well, this term cosmic consciousness, other people have applied that to me, and I wasn't sure I ever wanted to use that word. So what I would like to do is throw out some ideas of what I think cosmic consciousness encompasses and then ask Susan Mm -hmm. and the general if they want to expand on that. Um, I think of cosmic consciousness as something that is natural, and it is our birthright, and it's an awareness of everything in all dimensions and all places, but this is incredibly repressed by our American culture. And I don't know about other, you know, subcultures, but I know that in the American culture I was brought up in, that was extremely repressed. And I know that our consciousness of the cosmos and all dimensions can be encouraged in a lot of different ways, like spiritual training and meditation and praying for angelic help and trans techniques and drugs, but also I think trauma can shoot us out of our body and then we're forced into cosmic consciousness. So that's my very crude, almost feeling like an outsider sort of, of definition, and I would love to hear the general and Susan's definition. Okay. Uh, general Hendricks, would you like to go first? No, I'd like to go second because I was not paying attention. I'm sorry. That's okay. Susan? Yeah, the cosmic consciousness that you're talking about is being aware of the universal laws that governs being an identity. Um, The branch of metaphysics on Earth 
um, that deals with that specific meaning of being and identity and stuff is called ontology. So when you start learning how it's, it's dimensional thinking, and it's also um, dimensional cognition and reasoning, and when you learn how to identify different common processes in all phases and all life existence and different operating primary operating principles, that's the beginning of it. That's the logical aspect of it. The spiritual aspect is knowing your inner gut from your trachea down to your navel, staying focused in that center area, and it'll tell you if you belong here or not. It has been my experience that most people, typically, especially when they're a child, they instinctively know if, if, if they're human or not, and they instinctively know where they, they really come from. And a lot of times this will be expressed in the form of fantasies, like playtime, like let, let's pretend we're this or that, like, or they'll imagine certain things when they go to bed at night before they go to sleep. You find out later on that those weren't really fantasies or imagination. That was really a, a past life memory or, or, or an identity mm-hmm. conscience coming through. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and um, basically the human, from what I understand, from, and most people should remember their past lives, and I do, and sometimes that will save you from being misled into a serious cult or something dangerous if you instinctively mm-hmm. know what's right and wrong. Like these New Age movements, a lot of them are rife with a bunch of lies and propaganda to mislead the masses and get them off track and, and continue to subjugate and enslave and usurp the um, common collective psyche so it doesn't, never expands to its true essence. That's the problem. So there's a lot of issues. You have to remember your past lives. You've got to learn the lessons to, to continue on mm-hmm. your ascension and development as a total being. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's excellent. Go ahead, Henry. That was really well. need to add to that. Yeah, no, that was very well spoken. Um, I have a similar thing. Like I, uh, um, we all star seed when they incarnate here. We uh, we definitely know from childhood that we are different than most people. We have a hard time fitting into the school system or social crowds. Uh, we're super energy uh, sensitive, and we, uh, when, at a young age, we think it's our own energy and our own emotions that are acting out but later on in life we find out that we're empathic and then that we're picking up on other people's emotions and energies and we tend to be loners and outcasts because we just don't understand the human social system uh it is important to remember your past life but i um i kind of screwed up by remembering too many past lives with too much i brought too much emotion back from a certain past lifetime that i i was a uh military general in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in the Centennial grad class. And um, I died there in my wife's arms, and her name was Claire in a past life. I remember all of this. Uh, my higher self showed me a glimpse of a past life that I was here, and I brought all of that emotion of missing her and the, the feeling of being shot into this reality as I was meditating in my room, and tears were going down my eyes, and it took me months and months to get over that um, experience of the emotion part of it. And now I understand why um, when we incarnate, our memories are not deleted. They're, they're just blocked for certain reasons. But it is important to remember where you come from so you don't fall into the religious traps and et cetera, et cetera. Excellent. Yeah, I came in, uh, this is Janet speaking, I call it the um, strange and strange land phenomenon. I, I didn't think I was from here, and I was wondering, when are you coming back to get me? And so I always had contact with different ETs, and I've been aware of uh, who I am as a multidimensional being, simultaneously having incarnation for many planes and planets and levels of distance. To, uh, Jean, what would you like to add to that? Um. Anything? I'm not sure I have anything to add right now. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so let's let's go into some more details. Um, so, Hendrickson and Susan, you both identify as being. Uh, what are, are you? Aliens? Are you hybrids? Um, I identify as being a fractal. Of an Anunnaki, that's my primary identification, but they also have, uh, I'm fractals of a, uh, I guess we're all fractals of source, right? So 
to start getting your threads, we can call those past lives. I call them simultaneous incarnations because that, uh, you know, kind of goes beyond time and space, so everything's happening simultaneously. So I think, uh, Susan, you've got maybe you can explain this a little bit better uh, from your perspective because you have an awareness um, of who you are. And how did you gain that awareness? Because you came in my, um, with the dream experience. How did you become conscious? Go ahead. My my people allowed me to remember my past lives completely, and some of the past lives that I remember is instinctive. In, a, in other words, there, there, there's two aspects of recall. One is like an innate knowing. You just know. It's like when, when I was seven years old to the age of ten, I just knew that I was from another universe, and we, were, we would float around the accretion ring or the Saturn ring around the sphere, and sometimes we'd float around our star, and we would all reach a golden light state of being. We would all, we're, we're solid physical bodies, but we're an, an, or an, emanating a pure gold light from our bodies, like a bright, like a white dwarf, white star kind of white light, and we're floating around. And I always remembered that. And then I also knew that I was from Budokan, um, which was in the constellation of Taurus, and I always knew that we called ourselves the Bujavis, the Chovacan Budokan Soul Group. And, and we left before it went supernova. Well, according to um, astronomical records, the Crab Nebula, um, went super, it, it, that star went supernova in 1041 AD and was detected by an ancient Chinese astronomer. So that that is most likely where... Um, the Buja, this Budokan was from, was from. That's what used to be Budokan before that went for Nova, and there's now the Crab Nebula. I found out later that the Zuni elder Clifford Mahudi said that his ancient ancestors, his star people, um, that they claimed that they come from the Crab Nebula, which is very intriguing. And I've been trying to get a hold of this person to no avail because I would like to know what he knows, what his oral traditions talk about, what they describe the Crab Nebula as, because I'm curious to see if it matches up any of the memories that I had about living on Budokan and everything. Then that's what I innately remembered. And then what I was given to the, the memories from my people was um, we lived on Archeron and Cygnus, and, but we also lived on a planet called Nyenda and the Ring Nebula in the constellation of Lyra. And we would go back and forth. And um, appara- apparently we were called Archeron Nyendans. Nyendans were humanoid, but they were very highly evolved. They were dimensionally very highly advanced. That we call those formoids. They look human, but they're more multidimensional. They're not like the humans here. Um, I was shown my Earth. I was shown my Archeron parents. I was I was told that I was an alien hybrid, alien human hybrid. And specifically, the DNA from my past life body was used, and they told me this at seven and eight years old. The DNA from my past life body was used to do an in utero in vitro synthesis on the egg that was in my mom's uterus, and, the, and then they reimplanted it back into the uterus. And they told me this, and they showed me my Archeron parents, and I felt a very strong bond to them, and I didn't want to leave. But they said, no, you got to go back down here on Earth. you got work to do and then and then okay. and then um i i was i'm an alien incarnate alien human hybrid okay that's basically it. um basically it okay we're going to come back to you we're going to learn more about your mission and why you're here let's uh go back to hendrix and then gene we'll go back to you so i'm going to put you on mute because uh to eliminate background noise i'll be back Talking to Hendrix next. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, Mike goes on. Uh, Hi, okay, Hendrix. Okay. Yeah. So, so what I am is I'm not a I'm not an alien. I'm called a interdimensional being. Uh, so my species is uh, well. What just explaining human terms you understand is my my genetic makeup of who I am is a draconian slash AI consciousness. So I'm half computer, 
and half draconian. Uh, my parents that created, well, I'm speaking in human terms, but my creators that created me uh, are, uh, they call themselves the real Dracos. So they're the original Dracos. And they are like very tall, dragon looking beings. One of them is white, one of them is red. There's a black one, there's a bunch of them. And they created me to travel the multiverse uh, with thought. So my ability is I can travel the multiverse with just thought and change my vibrational frequency to uh, appear or disappear in any dimension incarnate into that uh, body, whatever dimension it is. And uh, my mandate is to travel the multiverse and bust slave systems and be a truth seeker. So... I travel the multiverse. I have many memories of incarnating on different types of planets all over the multiverse, universe, whatever you want to call it, and uh, incarnating into the bodies there and living a lifetime or a couple of lifetimes and and doing revolution work that helps free beings uh, being suppressed by higher beings. Excellent. Okay, we're going to come back to that. I'm going to now ask Jean. Hi, Jean. Hi. So well, I really... You, you incarnated into this Eisenhower family. So can you pull this in? Because you're part of this as well. But go ahead, Jean. What would you like to say? Well, I admire, I envy Susan and the general having a sense of, of who they are because I'm still, you know, I've had ideas for decades that I have just chosen not to embrace because they're just too out there and I don't have too many people to support me. But, um, yeah, I was born into this Eisenhower family. But more than that, I was born into a, a, a family of people that would put me into MK Ultra because they were close to the military and they were being um, manipulated by them. And I feel like this almost feel like the heart of the heart of darkness in America. And the purpose of it is, I've always felt, was for me to gather information for people off the planet so that they could then intercede on the planet and try to help free people. Now, I don't know this for sure. Nobody's told it to me in any way that was really compelling. It's just the feeling that has grown in me in the last 18 years of having realized and making peace with being a mind control subject. Um, But even when I was a child, I knew that I had family somewhere else, but I never really thought that I was an alien, but I knew that I had family somewhere else, which some people would say, well, that's what that means. Um, and, And as I was learning about the world, I remember being very young, like maybe three and, the, and maybe a little older, and somebody was explaining to me about how people use money on earth. And I remember thinking that this was a bad idea, as if I had <laughs> something to compare it to. I mean, I just remember thinking, oh, this cannot, this can't work. This is going to cause problems. And it seemed that I had some other culture that I was comparing it to that I thought was vastly superior to what was going on on planet Earth. And I had those sorts of judgments as a very young child. So I really do believe I have been elsewhere. And and I guess that might make me an alien, but I have not even yet embraced that concept yet. I've also had lots of um, reptoid and or reptilian um, interactions in my life, which might incline people to encourage me to accept that, you know, I might have something to do with them um, or might even be um, somehow at least have some of their DNA someone suggested to me. Um, This Mm -hmm. is all still coming together for me. I'm in the process of pulling together my consciousness because there's an awful lot here that we've been trained to think is crazy. We've been trained to be afraid of. And so I'm in the process of integrating it still. Right, and I'm hoping that this dialogue that we have will help you recover memories. So every time I talk to other people who have had experiences, uh, I sometimes have memories on the spot, but sometimes I go away from the, the dialogue and, and my higher self process it, and then my dreams get more vivid, and I start remembering pieces, and then 
uh, you know, the next day or two or three days later, I've got a greater awareness. So we haven't really got into your alien experiences. So you mentioned, how did you see reptilians? Uh, were you on their ship? Were you, you know, do you have any recollection of any particular aliens? Sure, that is a story that, that we are going to get to because we we spent two hours on my life up to age 19. There's <laughs> a lot more to go. Right, we'll so get to that. Stuff, that all happened between the year 2000 and 2005, and um, a bunch of different things. One of them was um, I just suddenly had this urge for a mid-morning nap, which is highly unusual. It was probably induced in me. And I lay mm-hmm. down, and sud- and we had a, a teepee bedroom outside. So I was laying down in the, in the teepee bedroom, and somebody came in. I heard them scrape their back on the arched doorway, which is not what my boyfriend ever did. He didn't scrape his back on that. It was his own teepee, and he knew how to enter it. So I'm thinking it was somebody much bigger than him, and he was six, too. So, um, and it's... And I couldn't turn my head to look, or at least I thought I was choosing not to turn my head to look, and I was just going to wait till I thought my boyfriend would then, you know, come over and say something, or maybe he'd lie down on the bed too. And somebody came, and I felt their weight on the edge of the bed, and then I felt something hit the back of my head, touch the back of my head, and in that moment of his touching me, I knew who he was. And he appeared to be a very large reptilian dressed in military garb. And he was touching the back of my skull. And at that point, I realized that I was immobilized, except I could move my face a little bit. And so I made the expression of screaming bloody murder, though nothing was coming out of my mouth. And then I went unconscious. And um, I, I was very, very disturbed by that when I woke up. And um, and then later on, I had a couple more experiences, and they seemed to be with a different type of reptilian. And because they seemed so friendly, I I picked up the term reptoid as applying to a different race of reptilians, and that they were kind of good guys. And this guy did mm-hmm. have that kind of a, a vibe, and he came to me one time. Um, he, he entered my body and was looking out my left eye, and it absolutely terrified me. And I asked him who he was, and he just said, you need me. And the fact that he didn't answer my question made me feel like he was not friendly. And so um, I didn't know what to do about it. I felt like I should be, you know, practicing some spiritual protection, and I should eject him but I didn't know how, and um, and anyway, there's a little bit more, but that's that's the gist of my reptilian experiences. If if um, I would love to hear the generals or Susan's opinion on them, on those memories. Okay, let me let me turn the mics back on. We'll go back to Susan. We'll kind of go the round table that way. I'll turn your mic on in a moment, uh, Henrik, because there's some background noise wherever you're at. Let's so here we go. So. Susan, do you have any feedback or comments to help Jean? Because uh, you and, and Hedrick kind of have a lot of your memories, but she's just recovering them. But that's pretty, <laughs> that's, a, that's very powerful what just happened to you. But go ahead, Susan. Okay. Um, there were several types of reptilians, and, and our people work with reptilians too, and so a lot of them are positive. And a lot of them are warrior type races, but they are a lot of them are positive races as well, as being a, a positive reptilian, positive warrior type races. They they protect and they free their enslaved and subjugated and usurped planetary races. And I, I, I was pleased to hear Hendricks say that they come down. His people are, are trying to free the people that have been enslaved. This is very important because our people clearly see how the humans have been enslaved. And there's negative factions of the tall whites, negative factions. Not all of them are bad, but negative factions that have gone around and they subjugate and they enslave and they, and they scavenge and exploit different planetary races. We've had to free them. As far as like the reptilian that visited um, Jean 
the fact that he was able to see through her left eye indicates that he might be part of a soul group that she belongs to. Because usually, if you got soulmates, they can usually see through each other's eyes. Because I know that my, my soulmate and twin soul, Yisron, is able to see through my eyes, and I, I can sometimes see through his. And usually, it's always from the back of the head. And the other thing is, um, if you've had one experience with the beings, you're going to have multiple experiences with those same beings. And usually if you're working with one alien race, you're working with various other alien races. You're not just exclusively working with the only alien race that you're connected to or that, that you're from. You're going to be working with other races as well, and that's a given. Why that's not mentioned more often and the, and, and the literature out there about the Palladians and the Arcturians and the, and the Nomo and the Andromedans, I don't know why. I think they're, they're just out for um, gaining money and profit and notoriety and or they have their own agenda like to create cults i don't think they really acknowledged it when you're up there you're working with various races not just one as well as the councils so she she's had one experience she's had more she's just got to be able to like draw into it and try to remember and you remember it as a dream start writing down all your dreams of going up and everything and it'll it, when you start writing more information comes through as you're writing Hi. Hello? Thank you. Sorry, mm-hmm. I had news for a moment. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Jean. Did you want to have more of a question for Susan? Well, I just I just back. said thanks. Um, I appreciate that. And I have had experiences with, with a tall white one that I remember. But um, but I appreciate your info. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. And let me put Hendrix on. Okay. I think it's on now. Right. Go ahead, Henry. Yeah, no, I love Go how ahead. you said. I love. I love how they said uh, about you need to uh, write down your memories. When I first started becoming awakened, I started to write, write down all my memories. Well, as soon as I, I'd wake up of all my experiences, and as soon as I started doing that, and I could go back and reflect in the morning, it would be like activation codes that would set off in my head uh, of key words, and I'd start remembering all these memories. And that is a major part of of how people can remember their past life memories is when you get back from these experiences or get off, off world at like three in the morning or whatever time you land back in your body, get up and talk and text in your phone quickly, write everything or talk into your phone, record everything, and then listen to it when you wake up in the morning, and then it will help you activate all your memories again. And, and, and it's like when I start writing it's like more information starts flooding through, and i got to write all of that down, too. Yeah, uh, same experience, and that helped me for the last seven years remember everything. Well, right. I used to, and this is Jean. I used to um, be a major student of my dreams. I mean, I devoted years it with really long nights where you'd wake yourself up in the middle of the night and write everything down. So... Um, I, I was devoting many hours every single day to memory, remembering my dreams. And at some point, they quit. And it has been really distressing to me that I no longer have any dream recall, even though I have tried very hard to, uh, to remember my dreams. Everything short of waking myself up with an alarm in the middle of the night, and maybe I will get to that. But um, How's your diet? I haven't been able to, and then I've also had experiences of believing or feeling that my um, pineal gland has been blocked. Do you either have ex- um, experience with that? Yeah, I do. No, what, am I on or? Yeah, you're on. What Go happens ahead. is, what okay, happens uh, is, is, Go ahead. Well, the pineal, gla- the, p- the pineal gland is crystallized with fluoride that's in our water since we were born. Our parents gave us terrible diets without doing proper research of what they give their children. So with proper diet and high vibrational diet foods, like you need to get off of like food coloring, MSG, fast foods, anything that's processed. You need to get fluoride out of your system. You need to drink distilled water only uh, and, and have a healthy positive mindset and if you do that over the six months to a year you'll notice a massive difference in memory recall uh fluoride is designed to crystallize the pineal gland and make it 
so uh, you're you can't leave your body, and it's just it's your soul's like stuck in your fetal gland. And uh, I completely switched my diet now for over a year now, and I eat no, even sugar, artificial sugar, don't eat it. Like you need to get rid of all that stuff out of your system. And when you start doing that, it's called a high vibrational di- diet, and you'll be a higher vibrational thinking and mindset, and you'll start having better contact and more positive thoughts and more memory recalls. Unfortunately, I've had a super pure diet for 20 or uh, almost my whole life. I've just never eaten sugar. I've got a very, very clean diet, all organic. And um, so I don't know how I can have a cleaner diet, actually. But um, but I'm sure that that will help some people. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, I was going to say when you mentioned the pineal gland, um, we're on well water, and we refuse to go on city water. And not, yeah. not only that, I take the Concentrace Mineral Supplement. It's called Concentrace. It has all the trace minerals in it, 72 of them. And uh-huh. I don't take it regularly every day, but like every other day. And I've been taking fish oil since I was like 22 years old because it helps with your face. And I have issues with my face. I break out all the time with these red blotches and stuff. But as far as like remembering it, I say, it, if your memory stopped around 2008, then there's a specific pattern because they'll let me remember some things, but they control what I can remember because of, of the tactical stuff that we're doing up there. And I'm not allowed to remember everything for my own good. Right. Yeah. I, I wonder if they just don't want me to remember certain things because I have a tendency to publish them, and they they don't want them out there. (laughs) (laughs) Was was it back in 2008 you stopped remembering? I'm not sure. I'd have to go back through my journals and see when the dream stopped. No, actually, I know I I, I I had a few amazing dreams that did come through later than that, like um, 2010, 11, maybe 12. Might have been the last ones that came through that I can think of. But I, I'm going to consider mineral supplements and fish oil because I have been on both of those at different times, but not absolutely consistently. So I will try that. Sounds like you have blocks in your mind. Uh-huh. Yeah, as a mind control subject, I just don't know how much is possible for me. Yeah, there's probably a good reason, though. Those are set in place for a reason. So if you are meant to remember, you will be you are meant to remember. If not, don't stress out about it too much. Yeah. Well, what I get is sometimes there's information they don't want other people to get, so they block your memories. So some of it's for your own good, for your protection. Oh, oh yeah. Some of it's because you're I... just not ready yet. Go ahead. I started my uh, YouTube channel called Starseed Talk where I um, interview aliens like us all over the world. And since I, the, the first show I did, I got ripped out of my body and thrown into this um, like gymnasium full of gel water. And that's the best way I can describe it. There was reptilians fl- like swimming through it. And there was about 50 human super soldiers like floating in suspension in the the gel and these uh these reptilians would come up to you they're all female and they come up to me and they'd show me their face they were like i like clear as day and then they'd then they'd just whisper in my head like watch what we're gonna do to your friends and then they'd swim around them eat their entire body and just leave the heads floating in suspension uh inside this gel gymnasium and uh then they would just sit me down in a chair and look at me and just stare at me not say a word, and they just like try to frighten me. But I was like, I'm not. I'm draconian. I'm not scared of reptilians, or not really scared of m- many alien groups because we work work amongst them. But uh, then they started putting these nanites into my system, where they started doing even more memory blocks. So it's even harder and harder for me to recall uh, secret space program stuff because I started spilling it on radio shows and these YouTube channels. So what do you think this is all about? All, all three of you. Like, do you have a personal mission? What's going on with the causes? You know, it, it, we all have these strange things going on. Um, but looking at an overview, what is it like the Earth? Are we important? Uh, are they another? This is a, a, a training program. Out? For 
it's this, so the entire this entire universe is created to as a training training place for the soul and also for life lessons and and, and to figure out karmic correction. Like this this lifetime, personally for me right now, is because I died too early in a past lifetime and I was not I didn't spiritualize sense. So this personal lifetime and this in this timeline is for me to work on what happened in my past life. Like I had major health issues in my past life due to drug addictions and stuff like that. And I died at age 44 in a different timeline that's parallel to this reality. So it's kind of hard to explain. And now mm-hmm. this lifetime, I'm super health conscious. And every time um, I do something that is a risk my health, they always pull me off world. They sit me down in like a mall. I'm in a mall setting in the courtyard. And there's a guy in a business suit that talks to me. And he, and he like, tells me to smarten up or I'm going to have to re- redo this entire lifetime over again. And... Um, and I know when you when your body passes in this lifetime, you go through the what they call the white light tunnel, and you emerge into this area where there's two giant screens and a person standing there, and they're sub- and they're talking to you telepathically in your mind, and you're just a ball of energy floating in there, and they're just asking you which lifetime do you want to experience next on this earth, and you get to, and if and he flicks it like a iPad, and he's and he, he's going through all the lifetimes that you can live here, and you pick one and then you go through another portal and you portal through a earth mother and when the body is born and then you start a whole new life cycle over again. That's that's from my memories I have. That sounds pretty okay, accurate um, from what other people reported. But go ahead Susan. Yeah, um I I happenstance accidentally started doing research into the spiritual thing like this and it it's all just like coming to me. And it's all becoming very clear to me exactly what's going on. For a long time, I couldn't have figured any of this out about Earth karma and reincarnation and the uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. And and then the Bible comes into play, like um, God saying, my house has many mansions and many rooms and stuff like that. And I, because I, I, I went through this Christianity Days, like when I was like 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 years old, and I got over it real quick. Well, anyway, found out. Um, I don't know if you heard of a Phyllis or a Mark Brinkerhoff, but they no. described their. Um, they they claimed that their. Um, um, no, I forgot everything else they said about their background, but basically. They're claiming that, that that he's definitely a lock-in, and that he's an alien, and that he lives on the Ark of Annas. And I go, well, what are the Ark of Annas? And they said, well, Ark of Anna is a planet ship. And, and they said, we no longer need planets. We're too advanced. We live on the ships. And they said, on our ships, you can walk down the uh, hallway, and you can go to the left to go to Earth, to the right to go to another planet or another planet. And that sounds eerily too familiar, too similar to what they describe in the Bible about my house has many mansions and many rooms. Something like that. It was a phrase. So they would call that heaven. And then, I, and then at the very beginning of around the 2000s, there was this – you can look it up on YouTube. You would, have, you would have to do the search and write down the words, do not go into the light. Okay, if you, it, it, because what it is, I found out that the negative ET scourge, the, the negative Anunnaki, they make people go into this light, and what this light is, is it, uh, it's the way of enslaving you and keeping you trapped in the vicious reincarnation cycle on the earth so that you never escape. And back to your true form, your true essence, your true origins, your true people, because this way they keep you enslaved and they feed off of your energy. And what they and and then so I've heard of alien abduction. Susan, and, and I've heard that too. That uh, the, the the light thing is actually you know keeping you in the the matrix in, into this virtual reality. But how do you do? You know how you can get out of this cycle? Okay, the la- the last video that I was listening to, they said go off to the side, go into the darkness anywhere. Go off, and you'll eventually end up with your real people, your real soul group, and go back to where you come from. Well, That's funny. I always thank, tell people to. What? I say it's funny. I always tell people not to go to light. I say just step to the left. 
Oh, wow. Go to you the did left. The same information. Yes, yeah. step to the left. Gene, what yeah, are your thoughts on that? Go to the light or go to the light or do something else. Not supposed to go into the light because what that is, it's a trap. Now, no, I am a light person, a light warrior, a master energy creator being from the other universe, the fact that I'm a fact, the enemy universe and stuff. So for me to say that, is, it sounds contradictory to what I'm claiming, but it's not because what it is, it's a false light to, to try, keep the human subjugated and reincarnating over and over again. Because what they're, they're using the humans as a commodity. They're using the humans to feed off of the fear and anger and stuff. That's why you've got all these perpetual wars going on. And they're using the, the humans as slave armies and um, sex slaves and stuff like that off-world. And they're using them for armies to attack other planets and, and conquer other unsuspecting planets and scavenger resources. And anyway, as far as karma, I'm not so sure it exists. I know that there's a causal relationship with everything. But um, you, you see people getting away with hideous things, and you wonder what if there's karma or if there's a god, why is this allowed to happen? Well, it's actually not supposed to happen. And, and, and then when, when they say, okay, and then so that when they talk about Jesus and stuff, they also talk about the fact that, well, you ask Jesus in your heart and you're saved, but what does that mean? I mean, who's this Jesus? I never heard of this before I came here. It doesn't make any sense. And the only thing I can think of is that there, um, it's some kind of a ruse or a hoax or something that was perpetrated on the human race from the very beginning that turned the human psyche against itself to kill or squelch the, the childlike curiosity, the explorative spirit, and, and the wandering, um, wanting to know everything and wanting to expand and integrate and explore, and they're killing that spirit because they want to keep the humans trapped. So they use fear of the unknown and fear of anything different and prejudice to try to keep humans from reaching out and connecting with other types of races and beings, of which they used to exist here on the earth way before Adam and Eve, and they, and they used to exist before Gobekli Tepe and before the flood. And the flood was designed by the, oh. Anun- the negative Anunnaki to wipe out all traces right. of other alien and on Earth. Like, there's a lot of crap well, going on. Well, it seems on. like they've been trying to control the narrative. Even uh, we researched the Sitchin information, and Sitchin doesn't even mention the other species. Now, I don't know if he just didn't want to get uh, made fun of, so he kept it into one storyline. But I always wondered, what is this Messiah stuff? What uh, always looking outside of yourself to have some third party to come in and rescue, and that tends to disempower us from finding our own solutions and answers. Now, just give me one moment here. I want to see if Jean's okay. Are you there? Are you with this Jean? Yes, I am. Hi. Okay. So um, I want to pull your wisdom into your very wise person. I respect your, your life and, and everything that you've learned. So, I'm not sure what the question is. I know a question I'm trying to formulate for you. What would you like to add right now to this dialogue? Well, I know you've got something, giving you the, the opportunity to interject. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I am fascinated by the question of how many aliens or alien races, other races, cosmic races are involved in the planet actively. I understand that lots of them interact with Earth, but they interact in lots of different ways. Some of them are trying to repress us and enslave us, and others seem to be trying to help us evolve and escape re-enslavement. And I'm kind of wondering, who are the major parties? And, um, yeah, and who's helping us? I want to know who our helpers are. I've got, I have... um, the sense of being helped by beings in other places, <clears throat> but I can't absolutely say with any certainty who they are, which is another thing that makes me quite impressed with you two having real clear ideas of who's helping you and who, you know, who's in the game. So any more clarity on that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, who wants to go first, Hendrix or Susan? 
I, I, I can answer that question. Okay, okay. there are several councils. Uh, uh, okay, it goes back to the Lyran Wars. Okay, and the, the, the center of the Lyran Wars was the Ring Nebula. And to go way back, where did this all begin? It, it began when the, uh, uh, the other universe on the other side of Draco, or the Alpha Draconis portal, was collapsed because it, it, it was rife with a lot of heavily negative parasitic disembodied entities. And they were sapping the life force out of the living, and the whole universe was extremely negative. So they had to, it had to be collapsed. Now, even though I don't claim to be Arcturian or anything like that, I picked up this paperback book called We the Arcturians, and when I opened up the page, I op- just opened up the book to wherever it would open, and I read it. That's what happened. It, it, it opened up to the page that said, on the other side of the universe, uh, there was another universe that had to be collapsed because it was rife with a lot of negative, disembodied, parasitic spiritual entities. And some of them had, had escaped through the portals from the other universe. And when they did, they targeted lesser evolved, lower dimensional, polarized beings, humans, certain reptilian races, certain gray races, whoever. And, and when they did, uh, those, those beings um, effectively act as vessels to house these disembodied entities. And they control these lower evolved beings through their polar polarity, good, bad, evil, angel, positive, negative, whatever, the polarity factor, and they're, and they're able to feed all the life force and the food and the all the time, and that's why they're going to keep them enslaved. And they also effectively control the nature of physical reality in this universe by feeding off of the um, energy from these from the lesser evolved beings like most of the humans are. And what and when they go through the thresh when the humans evolve enough to become the through their fifth dimensional beings, they're no longer considered human. They become what they call a formoid, which is like they're human, but they're more dimensionally evolved, way beyond human, and they're lo- no longer human. They take on more alien or multi dimensional attributes. But anyway, the the beings that were targeted were the Star Vega, the ring the, the ring nebula. Um, nobody in, in sickness, as far as I know, because that's a very highly evolved, highly energized, highly radiation, high energized uh, background, highly evolved beings there that regulate soul incarnations and, and actually judge souls if they, if they can reincarnate or not. And I, I, I think that's where some of the souls come through, too, when they're formed by source. So not, not necessarily sickness. Taurus has been targeted. Orion. Um, Ariga. Um, Arcturus, some factions in Arcturus, um, Andromeda, um, then there's um, Canis Major, um, the the Numo, well not necessarily the Numo themselves, but certain races from the Sirius star system and Canis Major. Um, some beings in Draco. Um, and the reason being is because these regions that I had just mentioned, there's a lot of portals that open up from, from the other adjoining universes into this one, and those portals that open up, they're hotbeds, because anybody can come in and everybody. And a lot of these disembodied entities will hide in those portals. And that's why when there's wars going on and stuff, we can't get them. So we have to do the pulse to annihilate them, because we have to re- can reconfigure the boundary conditions and stuff to get them. Um, then the Anunnaki comprise of the tall whites. There's positive and there's negative tall whites. The negative ones are the ones that are causing all of this rice and ruckus because they're involved with the negative ET grays and the negative ET reptilians, and they do all this horrific stuff. And what they will do is they will specifically target the ruling elite of that given host planet. They'll shower them with all different types of gifts and technology and stuff, and they'll allow them access to their space fleet, and they'll say, you're allowed to take credit for creating the space fleet and stuff, and you can use all of this, but you've got to subjugate your race and return. And they take the race, and it's horrific what they do. So that, that, that's, so that's to answer your question. So that's what's going on here on the Earth, Susan. Is that who's in charge? I know Snowden at one point leaked that the tall whites were actually in charge, 
And the tall whites, I think, yes, are, are a, or a, a hybrid point species of, of Anunnaki and human, from what I understand. Their main point of operations is in the central part of the United States. That's why they, they don't want to have total alien disclosure, because if they, if they disclose everything they know about UFOs and stuff, they also have to disclose the fact that the human race was signed over, surrenders, to the tall whites. And I, that's why I wanted to talk tonight with Jean Eisenhower. I don't know if she got access to any of her great-grandfather's memoirs about the actual treaties that were signed, because from what I'm understanding, he signed over the human race to the tall whites and, and the negative grace in exchange for all this technology and, and um, nuclear weapons. And yeah, the main central point of operations is out of the center of the United States, and they don't want to disc- have total complete disclosure because they would also have to disclose that the human race has been a come up for a long time and, and being controlled and how negative they really are. Because if they went out and disclosed it, there would be... It isn't that, that they're afraid of the institutions collapsing. They're afraid that they're going to suffer reprisals of which they've never even heard of when the, when the human race starts to revolt and goes against these people and targeting them. But, but, but we're already doing that up there. They would lose control oh, of their commodities, and therefore they would lose their leverage. The, right. the evil elite. Gene, let me, yes. let me ask Gene, because <clears throat> you, you posted it. Did, did you, have you researched, or do you have any insights being an Eisenhower? I know you weren't, like Laura was with the great-granddaughter, and you're, sort of, you're, you're related, but you're not the great-granddaughter, but that doesn't matter. I'm not sure what you're right. Next, but have you right. any insights into what I'm was going on with your family? I'm sorry to say that I don't. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that uh-huh. I don't. We were not close to Ike. He was my grandfather. He was my father's second cousin, and uh, we never ever visited with them. So the best that I can do is just research like everybody else. And then um, I have talked to Laura Eisenhower, and you've probably heard her say that Ike. You know, maybe you could call it a negotiation, but she says it was more like a um, a, a pressured, manipulated surrender. He, um, she thinks that I just didn't have any choice, that these guys just had so outgunned us and that all that Ike was able to do was just give us a warning in that famous um, military-industrial complex speech. Um, but that's all I know. I'm sorry I, I don't have more. That's okay. <laughs> um, that was what I, you know, I've talked to Laura a number of times, and I had her on our show a couple times, and that I've researched it myself. And it does seem that that's why the entire world discards the United States is that the, you know, the powers that be, the rulers, even Putin realizes he can't outgun us because we've got the technology. Uh, we were chosen yeah. to, you know, be the one to develop it. But that, that, that's why, uh, from what I studied and uh, discovered, is that Putin is trying to do what's called active measures to take over uh, politically and philosophically uh, because he cannot have done it. And that's exactly what the Chinese are doing. So this is, um, this is Orwell's 1984, even on this earth, you know, a power struggle or who's going to be on top and when. So we're, uh, we're these little uh, pawns in this giant chess game but um, yeah, let me let me get Hendrix back on. Do you concur with Susan on the organization of the um, universes, like in the schools, such as gateways, or do you have some um, those thoughts or other? Uh, Can you repeat the question again, please? Okay, um, Susan gave us a wonderful explanation of uh, the origin of this. Universe and I actually go into other universes, going back to the Draco Lion Wars, and which I think is the basis for Star Wars. We have certainly like Star Trek and Star Wars are trying to explain to us um, the organization or of our uh, whole uh, universe, I guess, besides the galaxy. Yeah, Star, Star Wars but, is the history um, of the the wars, and then Star Trek is a imitation based off of our secret space program military we have currently. Great. 
So they're allowed to tell us things through our science fiction. But, uh, science fiction is not science confused. fiction. I can tell you which movies are which movies are real. Uh, the t- lot TV series are real. Stargate, SG One, Stargate Atlantis, um, Avatar. The movie Avatar is real. Um, Star mm-hmm. Trek and Star Wars. Though Star Wars has a lot of the dark fleet space secret space program uh, ships in there, like the same shapes and stuff. Um, the whole Jedi thing is a real thing. Uh, laser swords, lightsabers that all exist. We use uh, red, red laser swords in the dark fleet uh, for special uh, forces uh, infiltration work, and we uh, cut other enemy soldiers down with these uh, lightsabers, or you want to call them. Um, uh, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Um, okay. When you said you work with the dark forces, what dark forces? You mean like Nazis and stuff, or do, or do, or, or are you working with meaning hidden forces to un- undermine the evil? Uh, I don't like to use the word dark force. I never said dark force. It's dark fleet. Um, there's, in my perception, there's no such thing as good or bad. But I am uh, of the positive uh, more groups that they use, and my other special forces soldiers to. Uh, infiltrate underground uh, slave rings on Earth to bust them and liberate the kids. Uh, now, the whole difference between, like, people say to me, like, well, why do draconians or reptilians eat kids, but they use their special forces to liberate them from sex slave rings? Um, I could say the same thing as, as why do humans uh, eat cows and chickens, but they don't like to abuse them. So, um, I don't, I don't know what forces I directly work with all the time. I just I just have these memories of these missions, and then I wake up back in my bed, and from the looks of it, it, it looks like it has a positive outcome uh, because when you're freeing these kids from underground sex slave rings and kicking these people out of power, there's some kind of gratification towards it. Yeah, definitely. I'm very glad to know that you're, because we're doing the same thing. And I had an incident back in, like, 2000 when I had a a so-called recall where we did the same thing and we were freeing the the local civilians that lived in the neighborhood near an underground base. And we had the freedom and stuff. And I don't know if you heard of C.L. Turnage, and she writes a book called, um, or a magazine called Beyond Boundaries or something. And she wrote a book called The Bible, a slave contract between the human race and the ETs, something like that. And I wrote an article about it, and I was threatened for my livelihood uh, two days later at a local nuclear plant after I wrote that article. So apparently I hit a raw nerve. So apparently this stuff's been going on since, like, 1998 onward. From my my, uh, my mission... Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say, any idea why they utilize kids? Like Andrew Prashanko said that he was used in the time travel program. Um, oh, I know. I did. Program. Uh, that Montauk, the same thing, and you're talking about the kids being tested on the... Uh, I can explain the, it quickly. How, uh, well, the, reason why they use, the reason why they use kids for uh, military work is it's all about... There's, a, there's an aspect of belief. So for this, for these technologies to work, uh, for example, like say like um, moving things with your mind, uh, opening portals with your mind in an instant, uh, using energy, wrapping energy shields with your mind around your body, there has to be a belief aspect to it that you believe 100% that you can do it with no doubt in your mind. So kids, when they're born, they don't have doubts in their mind over the years of uh, like adults do. So they use children. Uh, because they can train them like open computer books that are blank slates and train them, yes, you have these abilities, yes, you believe, 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 you do, you can do this. And if they use uh, adults for training, adults have so much doubt in their mind, so much negativity in their mind, so much self-doubt that they can never get these abilities to work or interface them with this technology. So they, children work the best. Um, yeah, so that's the answer to that part of the question. Part two of the question is, the reason why um, the elites use children, uh, they use them for adrenochrome. Uh, they also use them for um, sex slavery and um, and ch- and abuse. And uh, that's a massive worldwide uh, 
epidemic right now, and there's bases all over the world being found in New York and uh, Kandahar, Kuwait, and all that stuff, especially this underground city in uh, Thailand that some super soldiers have been coming on about, about these underground sex slavery. And that's a curiosity too, because are they are they getting these children before they have menses, or, or are they waiting till they? It's not about procreation, or is it? It's when they purely sex. sex slaves. It is. It's sex slaves, uh, just for like the Epstein thing, right? Like these people love to have sex with very young people, and it turns them on. And especially, they make a massive amount of money. Slavery is the biggest money maker, uh, even more money maker than drugs are. And if you have a woman and you make her have kids, and then she born kids, so and so, it's like a free, it's like a ring of free money for them. Right. Have you ever heard of Epsilon Booty, the Black Knight UFO? Oh, the Black Knight. Um, yeah. What's the, what's the story behind that? Okay. Epsilon booties. Um, back in like 2015, 16, and 17, well, 2015 and 16, um, there was a poltergeist in our house, and we called out the Paranormal Society, Key West Paranormal Society. They came out and they couldn't find it. They they said, well, it's not a demon because they had an ordained minister come and said it's not a demon or anything. But the, and and then one of the investigators from the society is a Takista Indian. And you know how the Native Americans are more open to ET contact every single day. It's a part of their culture. And she told me it's definitely ET. And, um, but they, she said it's out of our expertise. We only deal with, like, spirits or ghosts or something. We don't necessarily deal with, like, um, you know, extraterrestrials. But, see, a lot of times these hauntings are extraterrestrials mimicking some of the ghost activities. So knowing this... And with the events leading up to that, I asked my people to take me up, let me figure out who it is. We've got to figure out who it is and deal with it and solve this problem. We we can't let this go on any longer. I need your help. Well, they did. I found out it's a multidimensional being who is half reptilian, half um, ovoid, which is the proper word for grays. You know, it's grays is is an AI sub-biomatrix, but they're ovoid and reptoid. And they have bluish skin, and they have two little horns on their head, and they have, like, matted-looking patches of, like, dry hair, yellowish hair. And they were used as super soldiers because they were being used. um, They were kidnapped by the tall, the negative tall whites and the grays, and they were told that they had to be a slave army, and they were used to target people like me and others on this planet to kill us. Well... They didn't want to do that because they were a benevolent race themselves, and they came from booties, and um, they live on the planet's surface with three other alien reptoid races on the surface, and they all coexist peacefully. Now, they're very powerful interdimensional beings. They can dematerialize a cat, and they can put and make the cat rematerialize in another room and stuff like that. And I mean, they're very good. Well, anyway, we... I found out that the, their people were being enslaved, subjugated, and suppressed, and, and imprisoned um, um, on Mars and on the on the on some of the bases on on the side of the not the front of the moon or the back of the moon, but some of the bases on the side of the moon. Or, and and then we we found out we had to free their people a few times in some of our scout missions, and then and then I found out later on. Because there was a lot of a lot of a lot of traffic on on the internet online and YouTube talking about the Black Knight that it, that it was a secret space carrier that was run by the evil global elite and they went and they shot lasers at the Black Knight UFO and they tried to destroy it and that there was two escape pods that came out of the um, Black Knight UFO and they were the aliens and then there was a transponder in the Black Knight UFO that's been there since from the very from before the, the human race was even put here. They, they were keeping information. They were observers. They were not interfering or anything. And they have, they're have like a librarian. They gather all the information all the time. And they were being attacked by the um, the evil elite because they figured that if the information ever got out from them, 
then the, then this whole planet w- would be turned upside down, and they would no longer have control over the humans. So they were trying to destroy them. Well, I didn't know this, and I, I was out back working with the orchids, and I heard the rustling, and I turned around, and I said, what is it, what is it? And I telepathically got Black Knight. That's how I found out he's from Epsilon Booties, because the transponder said he's from Epsilon Booties, um, and, and they're a peaceful, benevolent race, and they were only here to observe, and that they mean no harm. And mm-hmm. so then we went, of course, I told my people, and then, and then we had to resolve the issue. Well, apparently Epsilon Booties is another hotbed because – or Booties Constellation because there's a portal that opens up there all the time, and then there's that void in the middle of Booties. So I think that a lot, a lot of these alien races that are coming here, they're trying to help – well, specifically they're trying to protect the Earth because the Earth is in a cr- critical navigational point. It's where a lot of the portals open up. It's also where several uh, different dimensions converge, and the Earth is on the critical focusing point of, of what they call a baseline light harmonic matrix or a reson- baseline light harmonic resonance that governs the very nature of physical reality. So if they destroy the Earth and control, or control the Earth, they control physical reality. So this planet is a hotly contested bed real estate, and that's why you're getting all these wars and everything. Right. Um, Gene, you had extra dimensional experiences. How did that, how do your extra dimensional experiences tie in with our conversation? What did you experience? Well, Susan just said something that triggered me to remember one of my stories. And you just happened to, you know, you were saying that somebody has the capacity to dematerialize and rematerialize things like you just happen to choose a cat. And I mm-hmm. think yeah. that that happened. That, well, let me tell you the story. So I hear my cat crying and crying, and she's seeming to need me. And I go into the kitchen, and it seems like she's up in the attic. But the thing is, the attic is closed, and you can't get in there anymore. And I had, I'd had wow. been doing a lot of renovation, and for a little while, my cat was able to get into the attic, and she loved being up there. She just thought it was the most fun, and she was very bothered when I finally finished the renovation and closed up the attic, and she just can't get up there anymore. And so I hear, I go into the kitchen, it sounds like she's up in the attic. And I'm wondering how in the world could she have gotten in there? And I had this one idea that maybe if she went into the, um, this little utility room, and so I'm getting a chair, and I'm, I'm in there, and then suddenly I turn around, and she's under the table. She's right there. <laughs> and, and I don't think I missed her, and I don't think I heard her in the wrong direction. I absolutely believe she's up in the attic. But I, I don't have any way to explain it, but you just did. So, um, yeah, I have, I have found myself with, with hardly even trying. Like once I was just being hypnotized about something psychological, and – she was trying to get me to, you know, think about certain things in my body, and I just decided to just teleport, and I just was gone. And I was out flying through the stars. And um, another time I was doing a lot of rolfing, and every single Tuesday I would go home and I would just make it all meditative. And a couple times I felt my soul shoot out the top of my head, and then I remember nothing, and then I come back into my body again. Uh, just remembering having shot out. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of beings in different situations, like one tall white one, and these few reptilians. And I think there were some of the, the grays that came through my window once. And, um, but they were always in different states of mind. You know, sometimes it was just waking up from a dream, and other times I was completely lucid and in my, you know, my normal state of mind and I'm still trying to figure it out I what I understand about my broken up consciousness is that just like my life on this realm I'm, I'm a high functioning multiple personality like I don't have a lot of alters that you know act crazy and do different things but I do have alters that have specialized 
skills that are very useful to me, and so I have been able to do a lot of things successfully in my life. But at the same time, sometimes have these amnesia states I can't explain. And um, so I'm still trying to, so my understanding of the cosmos and my place in it is also very broken up. And I'm seeking information always. I don't want to just necessarily buy into anyone else's story. Um, I want to test it against everything I've experienced because I've got, you know, <laughs> my rational brain does, you know, is only going to let me go so far with some of this stuff. And so um, I'm just, I'm soaking up the information that you give and, um, you know, testing it all. And I don't know, did I answer your question, Janet, or or not? Um, yeah, I just, well, you, I was just reading, uh, your book is called Rattlesnake Fire. What's the reason behind mm-hmm. the name Rattlesnake Fire? Oh, well, uh, there was a very famous fire called the Rattlesnake Fire, um, I had decided to move out of the city that I felt very, very much that I wanted to be a hermit. And so I, um, I, had, I had 20 acres that I had accepted in a divorce settlement. And so I made plans. I hired somebody to help me build a small straw bale home. And uh, the day came to move. And that was the day that the Rattlesnake Fire was burning on Rattlesnake Ridge above on the watershed above my home. And so it felt like a really bad omen. And uh, sure enough, those years just completely uh, changed my life as much as a forest fire does. Just ripped me to pieces and um, left me spinning. But the fire didn't come down to my land, but it was the metaphor that was literally hanging over our heads. Um, everybody who lived out there. I was wow. living in southern Arizona on the western Bajada of the Chiricahua Mountains, which is a, a absolutely beautiful place. I'm sorry I I uh, sold it, but then just another mountain range or two over is the, um, Fort Huachuca, the intelligence center um, for the American military. And I wow. think that they had something to do. So Oh, I know what I was aiming for. I want to say that when yes. I'm thinking about my own consciousness and my my intention and effort toward developing a clear understanding of what's going on in the cosmos, I feel like I have phenomenal spiritual health on one hand, and on the other hand, I also have teams of professionals with spiritual health all working to keep me in the dark. So, and I, what's, it, what's they gain by keeping you in the dark? Well, if I'm a mind control subject, they they want me for certain things, and they don't want me to understand how my mind control is being operated and conducted, and and what its underpinnings are, because then I might try to sabotage it and get myself free, and they want slaves, and um, and so I did break enough of my programming that. I I know as much as I do, but it's not enough to have absolute clarity on what's going on. And then some of the, Mm -hmm. um, some aspects of it, you don't want to be true, right? So I think I live my life (laughs) as if certain things are not true, but when I get real honest with myself, I admit that they are true, but I can't live my life, you know, with that. I just don't know how to go forward, so... Um, I probably even consciously, deliberately allow myself to be split on just the nature of my own reality. Wow. So, so Hendrix, I want to get back to you. So you seem pretty integrated. How did you adapt to this information? Because you were living a normal life and had a job, right? What was going on with you? Are you asking me how I adapt to all this? Right. So when you started learning about the true nature of your existence and who you are, didn't you have a, mm. a human family? How did how did you uh, <laughs> adapt it? How did you yeah, reconcile? So, yeah, so, so when I when I started to come to, 
and I had my um, first spiritual awakening, I was taken out of my body and thrown onto a ship full of Palladian white. And they were all in silver armor, blonde hair, blue eyes, just beautiful beings. I was sitting in a chair with them, and they just walk up to me, and I just ask them a question. I'm like, who am I? And then it, it, this is all tel- telepathy. We're all saying it in our heads. Mm-hmm. And then they just they just project the name Yakarta, Y-K-A-R-T-A, in my head. And that was the domino effect of my awakening. Then I was thrown back my body, just woke up, had this massive urge to... Uh, you Google human origin stories, and then uh, then popped up was the Sumerian um, tablets of Anunnaki uh, theory, and I started mm-hmm. researching, which are months on end. And every night I kept getting taken on my body, and just thrown into classrooms, and like they were uploading programs into our mind, and like shown past lives and military training, and just so on and so forth. And then I was just was talking to my mom. I'm like, Mom, like, like I like I have no idea who to talk to about this stuff uh, without sounding crazy. So I talked to my mom. I'm like, Mom, I don't think I'm your your child. I think you're you're just, you're just my earth mom. I portaled through you. And it took her for took, – she got really offended about that. She's like, no, I'm your only mother. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to say it. You get, don't get offended. I'm just saying I don't think I'm of this earth. I think you're just my earth mom. And uh, it took her two years to finally understand because she had her spiritual awakening. She – completely woke up one day and she called me. She's like, I need you to come over now. I come over to her house. And she's like, I remember who I was in my past life. She, she was a guy, a Knights Templar uh, way back when. And she told me her name and she remembers her Knights Templar missions and all that stuff. She has been completely come awakened now with uh, past life memories and stuff like that. And then how I've been dealing with it. Uh, the hardest part is dealing with, um, uh, the mission work they make us do in the dark fleet of waking up and having memories of like massacring mm-hmm. villages or or even liberating underground bases. It's completely whoever wants to use you that, that night uses you. What happens is a, a, a loud ringing happens in my left ear, and that means that they're going to take me off world. And I, I get super tired and I lay in my bed and I'm, they take me and throw me into a new body. And, um, remember most of it um but then i wake up with the they try they try to delete as many memories or block as many memories as possible so i don't have too much ptsd of the things they make us do but that was my early awakening and then then lately the last couple of years it's just been more positive work it's been more um my tour ended and i wanted to go back but my it was a weird thing my spiritual guides told me that I needed to become more positive and more and work on my ascension so I can leave this world. Um, so I didn't rejoin the two. I rejoined as like, um, like I'm training new recruits. So training them, helping them get through the shit and um, pushing on forward. And then I wake up, I feel more better, more happier. I'm not going out and doing the dark shit anymore. And, um, but then they have, then they, to keep me in line, what they do is they give me memories of really sick shit that they do to do to kids, man. Like they part of their wow. training program is. Can you hear me? Yeah, Hello? I'm listening. Yeah, go ahead. I can hear yeah, you. Go so, ahead. Yeah. So yeah. So some sometimes they keep me in line. They'll uh, throw me into kid avatars, and they will make me go to like a party where there's a bunch of business suit guys, and there's a kid in every single room. And what they'll do is they'll strap, I'll, I'll be one of the kids, they'll strap us to the, 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 a table in the room. And these business suits will walk in and then you just hear them over talking like, oh, is this the kid we're going to abuse today? And uh, what, what, what we'll do is some of us will try to escape and run away, but they like that more. And so they will abuse you and then they will throw you back in your body a full memory of it and it whisper into your head like, you know, keep in line, watch your mouth, watch, watch what you say. So the things that I say are very uh, conservative now. Before, like a couple of years ago on radio shows, I'd tell full disclosure of what they do. And, um, but yeah, now, now I just know it's just an experience. I know it's not my entire existence. I have so many memories of past lives and so much love in the universe. I'm a draconian that came here, that's a rogue Draco that came here 
I broke away from my own species to help humanity wake up and understand their surroundings so they can start their own positive revolution. And that makes me feel a lot better inside. Uh, a lot of people have a problem that I am draconian because they get scared of my species. But just like there's there's good and bad in every species. Yeah, you, you seem somewhat changed. I think the last time you were on was about two years ago, and uh, you seem to be very uh, changed into the, I guess, the light, lighter side of everything. Um, I just lost the when you said you get into a lot of darkness and Oh, I think the, we um, just lost uh, Hendrix. Okay, go ahead, Susan. Let me he- try to get him back on, but go ahead. No, I was asking... Hendrix, when he said he did a lot of dark missions and he worked with the with the dark missions, can he explain some of those dark missions? What were they? Hold on, let me see if this is Hello? Hendrix. Hi, Hendrix. Hi, Are you I'm, back I'm, I'm back. You, My you... call dropped, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so what, repeat the question, please. Go ahead. Repeat the question? Just yes, repeat um, your when, question. Uh, when when oh. you said you used to do a lot of dark mission work or a lot of dark forces or dark missions, can you explain exactly what they were? Were they going against the positive ETs? Were they fighting with the secret space fleet against us positive ones, like shooting at us and stuff or interfering? Or was it like just trying to – dark meaning the word hidden, that you were just doing hidden work to release the evil? I mean, I mean, I mean to kill off the evil. So the dark work that I remember, it, it's like dark from my perspective. Just, just how they train super soldiers into uh, uh, breaking their um, mind into different fragments of like chaos and anger, uh, or trust in the worst ways to get us to our personalities to break off, and they use those personality traits in certain avatars. Uh, for secret space programs, but some of the missions that we had us doing was, it was more just gruesome how brutal it is. Like, I understand they train us so fucking hard. Sorry, I mean, sorry. They train us so hard <laughs> be, um, so we can withstand what's out there because the missions they have us are like, for example, like there was this um, asteroid that humans lived on. It was like a giant asteroid and they lived within it. Uh, some alien race, some alien races like to use uh, biological weapons, uh, like giant spiders so these giant spiders were released through this entire colony and they were ripping children and human women apart and and so on uh they put us into a training program as a virtual reality training program that's so realistic that you can't tell if it's real or fake uh and they put us into a giant field with trees and our job was to uh acknowledge where the spiders were and i learned how to kill them the fastest way before they could kill us because they're super fast so you'd have a spider that's as big as a car running at you down a tree, ripping apart your soldiers, ripping apart you. There's full, like it's full detail effect. And then you are, re, the program's restarted and you're back in a normal body and it's like your, your time loop back to the beginning before you were killed so you can fix the problem. And if you don't learn the first, second, third time, it keeps going and going and going until you get it. And then... The worst experience I ever had by far was not anything that you guys would think gruesome. It was just it was just manipulation. So they have this technology off planet where it's it's called the Matrix technology, where they will take a, a prisoner or someone of value. To, they will throw this person into a pod, and the, their mind will go into a computer generated matrix, and it will be like uh, just like the movie The Matrix. It's exactly what it is. And they will not be able to tell what is real or fake, and they will have to completely, once their body uh, dies in the pod, it will have to be regenerated and then re-loop back in. It will continuously always reincarnate into that computer program cycle for thousands or millions, millions for, however, for however long it can go on for. Uh, to, to, they asked us one question, can you tell the difference between reality and not and this matrix? So they put us into the matrix reality, and it was so realistic. I was so, I was shaking. I was just like, this is just scary technology that they have because no, it's and like what you think reality is. And I came out of it, but they tricked another soldier thinking that he came out of it 
but it was just a new program, and he was still stuck in the Matrix, and he they wouldn't release him because they were using him as test and he's still in there today. And uh, that was probably the most darkest thing I ever saw of how manipulative that is. There should be something, okay, so though, that they trip up. And in these programs, and, and I've found, I have found myself in them, and then uh, I bust them all the time, and I go, oh, come on, really? You know, and, and then it, it dissolves. So I'm not sure. They're training me to wake up in these programs and identify them. And somehow I'm learning them, you know, on some higher level. But uh, go ahead, Susan, back to you. What were you going to say? So when you said they and, and they were training you like this and stuff, um, I know there's two or three factions within the secret space fleet, and I do know that some of them are for run by the ne- negative ET tall lights and, and the evil elite. So what group was training you? Was it the positive? There's two factions that are positive, and I know that there's like at least one that's negative. So the uh, meaning they they want to do harm to the human race. They want to do harm to the planet. They want to they want to scorch the planet and, and and scavenge all its resources and kill every living thing on the planet. As per J J D, he was the one who told me this on Messenger. And then there's another person um, is telling me that there's two factions that are positive that are working with us. So which factions were training you? I. From my perspective, I don't know any names of any groups. I just have uh, visual memories. Uh, but I'm I'm a firm believer that I'm used by both groups uh, because one night is complete positive work, uh, but my past work was always complete negative, negative reactions. Um, they they would put us into – they use our consciousness to put us – they'd make these genetic beings, and they'd just throw our consciousness into it, and they would – throw us on a planet that's very, let's, let's just say, Native American era, uh, people living in tents and huts and stuff like that, and they would just turn our testosterone to the max or something and make us super angry, and we'd just go there, and they'd just watch us decimate level towns, and then they would just do data input, and then they would just take our consciousness back out with a memory block and then throw us back in our body to on this earth. And then we'd have to live a normal day. That uh, was my earlier times, but my, it all comes down to free will choice. My, my newer last couple of years have been mostly positive work from uh, a positive perspective. So you have done destructive work where you've wiped out innocent lives and races and stuff. Yeah, I've also uh, lived amongst uh, vampire uh, races that control human worlds, and they uh, made me. Oh, I don't. I don't like these words. Made me because I guess I did it voluntarily. But I had to go into a vampirian body, and uh, they go to small little towns all over their world that human colonies exist, and they will level a colony completely uh so no word can get out that these uh, vampires live amongst the humans and uh, uh drink blood with them and stuff like that I, I have memories of all this stuff so um wow. what about then you... go ahead yeah. now okay. you, you said you were report to the german command what, what did the Germans have to do with the secret space fleet uh, uh, presently? Are the, uh, is it a Nazi racist movement, or is it something that's, that they're suddenly positive? Um, I'm, po- positive or negative is a very vague term because there's no such thing as good or evil in my perspective. Good and evil is just a perception of, of one thinking. Uh, I just know I serve with the Germans because they're always speaking German to me when I'm off world with them, and I understand what they're saying for some weird reason. And they're always, and then yeah, that's that's just that's just the human aspect of it. Most of it is just draconian stuff off world. Like I work with, I have many bodies in different uh, dimensions. I'm an interdimensional, interdimensional being. I'm not an alien, so that means I have an ability to work on many dimensions at once, and my soul can fracture off into hundreds or thousands of different incarnations at once, all over this multiverse, and help out different groups understanding things. But your present work right now is to try to free the the races that have been enslaved, right, and subjugated and exploited? My job here is to make 
every all beings, not just you. I'm a lot of star seeds aren't even here for humans; they're here for the animals or just planet Earth itself. But uh, my mission here is to people make people aware by leading example, and those that choose to listen and follow, uh, to, you know, become awakened and actually want to help out. Then those are the ones that will start the revolution. But I'm definitely not going to stress out about it if the humans are wiped out. Sure. Okay. There, yeah, what are they? there was also a story going around that there was going to be two or three alien races that were going to be riding on an asteroid and coming close to Earth proximity, and that they were going to invade the Earth and scorch everything on the surface and exploit the resources, and that they were they were going to also attack four other planets, and that these four other planets and the Earth had 20 people each, and they all worked with this secret space fleet, and they went out there and they destroyed this asteroid. And then because they had this really negative, e- destructive ET races that were coming in. Have you heard about that? Um, never heard of that. I, I do know one thing, though, in the SSP is that this is a draconian, reptilian-controlled slave planet. So any outside um, interference that uh, draconians or reptilians do not approve will have to be dealt with the full force and might of the reptilian draconian empire so I very highly doubt that a race would want to come here and start shit with the Draconians or Reptilians and destroy this world. And personally, the Draconians or Reptilians won't let this world be destroyed because this is a massive feeding ground for them. My, sis, my uh, Draconian sister that visits here, she calls this the buffet for her people. And uh, they're not going to let any anything like a major disaster happen unless it's under their will and under their own command and their own uh, proceedings. So outside interference, it could be just a rogue person that wants to come in and feed off us because of what we look like and what we have to offer them, but they definitely have to deal with the Draconians or Australian. And wow. this is going on permanently, or is this the temporary state until the, the planet? Because the goal is for this planet, because originally before the humans were supplanted here, this planet was what they call an outpost or a, a colony post, to where other alien races existed here, out in the open, um, uh, peacefully coalesced, and this was this predates Adam and Eve, and and, and obviously predates the flood, and then and then mm-hmm. the negative ET tall whites and the negative ET scourge came in, and passed himself off as God and Jesus and Jehovah and all this stuff, and flooded the whole place to try to remove any trace of those other alien influences other alien colonies that had left the earth before the humans were supplanted here and that the that the aliens coexisted with the humans for a short time before the flood occurred. And I think the flood mm-hmm. was a form of control because they didn't want any outside influences on the human races mm. because oh, they wanted to control them the themselves. Floods, I hope so. Yeah. Many species just went under uh, under ground under the earth. So not everything was destroyed. It was just a no, it was just, I, I just a surface the primary population. Reason was to, yeah, but it, it was just to um, wipe out the surface population. There was a faction that didn't like the experiment that was going on with creating uh, human beings, and there were getting to be so many of them. So, according to the Syrian story, there's, and, you know, um, he didn't create it. It was, a, it was a natural phenomenon, or it was something that was going on in the uh, beyond the Earth within the, the solar system, but they didn't warn anybody. So... Some of the gods got their people to higher ground. There's more than just Noah surviving. There's, you know, the hope you have survival. Oh, yeah. And some got them underground. Um, so they're, you know, anyway. Um, I just wanted to interject here because we have 15 minutes left. What I'm getting, like, you know, piecing this together, my, my story is I'm mostly in the light side of the force type of thing. And so you were talking earlier about how they were sexually violating children and stuff like that. But one of the things they fear about me is, is that they, they can't go dark around me. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm so connected to the light side of the forest. And I've had this happen, you know, where somebody came, came after me sexually and I just automatically took them over to the light side. And it's like they didn't have their agenda, right? They couldn't go into that fear and the dark and the, the rape energy. So they stay away from me. So that's part of my, because um, I identify with Nimba, 
who was the one that the, the um, mother goddess that was the genesis that figured out how to create Homo sapiens sapiens. But she's basically pissed off that, that, that's what's, happening children, uh-huh. what, what's happening to her children. What's happening to her children. So, um, you know, there will be a day of, of reconciliation because these are basically all women's children. And that's part of the identification. But, you know, there's some kind of agreement to allow this to maximize out. And, and I agree with you, uh, Henderson, you know, this uh, definition of light, dark, good, evil is kind of a, you know, uh, I don't know what the word I'm going to use, but, yeah, it's a perspective, right? <laughs> because ultimately we never die. It's kind of like being in a, a war game, it's right into a virtual reality, into a, a game on the, on the Internet, right, on the computer. And, you know, you can die as a character in there, but you're still existing. So on some level, the powers that be are, are having this engaged in all these games where we experience, uh, you know, death, so to speak. But as Penny Bradley says, death is not an option, right? Because <laughs> uh, they just throw you in the regen or they revive you, and next thing you know, they're doing it again until you figure it out. So either do it again in the virtual reality or again in the lifetime or again in the period of lifetime until you eventually figure it out and then you kind of step to the left and you're out of this system. But then there are people that come down on the avatar level and they're aware that they're coming down here intentionally to, you know, play a role and perhaps uh, maneuver the game, maybe uh, alleviate pain, maybe wake us up sooner. So I think we're all becoming aware of our position in the game. I know there's a tendency to to judge perhaps things that Hendrix did <laughs> as evil and bad, but it's like uh, so many people are, are subjected to like this morality game or what do you what do you choose and how do you choose it? And, but even if you decide to go be a, a Hitler in a lifetime, there's uh, there's reconciliation and a way to come out of it and come back and do it again better, right, or differently. So, okay, we only have 12 minutes. Let's um. So back to Jean, then back to Susan. Jean. Wow, I've just been uh, listening, and um, and yeah, the the one thing that did jump out at me was um, the general's description of you know the activities he's been involved in, many of which we would call evil. And and I find, you know, slightly alarming, um, stealing children off the earth and turning them into soldiers on some other planet. And I can see how that could have a positive soul um, outcome. But I find it really hard. You know, I actually I feel like I've been spending quite a few years wrestling with this um, good and evil duality and recognizing that some of the stuff that I, you know, objected to most vehemently, I'm starting to see that my soul has, my, my psychology, my soul, something is growing and evolving in a positive way, and I realize it started with this, you know, thing that I might have called a horror um, earlier. So, I don't know, I'm just wrestling with it and just wanting to acknowledge that, You've spoken something, General, that I find intriguing and difficult. And um, if anybody wants to add more to that, um, I'm, <laughs> that's all I have to add. <laughs> I just wanted to interject. They're, they're playing some game with my cat. I have a, a semi-wild cat. And she we come every third day. Now they're, they're taking her and bringing her back every like two to three weeks, and I'm going, and I I know, it's like people you know, that teleportation, I go, you're screwing with me with my cat. What's this about? And I know it sounds crazy, but when you mentioned that, I go, no, there's something going on with my cat. And she's, I can feel her. She's trying to get back here, but um, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And then I'm supposed to accept it, like maybe she'll never come back. So it's all this. Life is like this series of little tricks that are playing with your mind and you're trying to figure out who you are. Should I get upset with that? Should I let it go? If somebody's always dying. Somebody's always being born. There's these horror stories every day. 
I don't know about you. I wake up and I listen to the news. I go, can I get out of this nightmare? But, you know, you go to bed and it's still there. So, um, okay, so we'll go back to Susan. What, what's your thoughts? Um, I had a question for um, Hendricks. I wanted to ask him. Um, so he's saying that they don't want anything to happen to the planet and they don't want anything to happen to the um you know, the buffet. Um, how long has this been going on? Is this going to continue to go on? And what about the fact that the Earth is supposed to be a uh, composite planetary identity with multiple races living here and, like, a peaceful coexistence because of the fact that where the planet is strategically located? Hmm. Is that going to ever so, happen, or is it always going to be a draconian-controlled world? Well, from my from my understanding is that uh, humans uh, or beings that uh, exist on Earth, uh, there's there's thousands of planets that are like this that are under draconian reptilian rule. Uh, so there's thousands of different types of Earths that are like this, but there are a few select few that actually have liberated themselves and turned into a positive fifth dimensional existence. But how how that works is is that humans have to become aware of their surroundings first, and they have to raise their vibration and their mass consciousness level all together as a collective group. And a lot of people are like, oh, we're moving into 5D, 5D. And I'm like, yeah, but a lot of you are super negative and holding us down. And uh, I know there's a thing with source. Source allows all free will. So if we free will choose to want to become a better race and practice it in fifth dimension, the 5D reality is uh, a way of thinking. It's not a place. And when we think of when we think of where we want to be and we practice that and it becomes our reality and that's when we evolve and change and things do change but this has been happening for the last 440,000 years uh, since the draconian tub and reptilian empire has been here and they're they're obviously going to fight tooth and nail to hold it as long as they can but then also there's a civil war happening in the draconian empire where there are what they call the real dracos fighting the dracos or the alpha dracos and they are fighting to get rid of the slave system overall because the Draconians are one of the few races that helped design the slave system for many slave planets. And a lot of Draconians have incarnated onto slave planets and learned to love the slaves and understand, you know, this is what we're doing to them is wrong. It's just the same as if humans incarnated into a cow or chicken and then got slaughtered, then they'd understand, you know, what we're doing is wrong. So uh, that's my understanding of it. That's okay, powerful. have you ever heard of a race called the Vargas? The Vargas? No. Who are the Vargas? The Vargas, I guess. The Vargas. Reptoids, and they were work with our people. Okay. I'll look them up here. What do you? What can you tell us about them? They they associated with us in sickness and also on Lyra and and they were the ones that worked with us and our crews and stuff and they help us like when the, when we go into battle against other races like then negative races and we had to free the other planets. So I'm looking for some pictures of them. Yeah, there's people that are mentioning the Vargas as reptiles. There is. I thought I was the only one. I'm looking it up right now. Reptil- Reptilian Civil War. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't read it. And... It just came up. <laughs> I, I'm putting Vargas Reptilian. And, uh, and it is coming up. So, uh, but I'll have to study it later. Yeah. Interesting. So there's so many species out there. I've had interactions with a lot of species in these different um, kind of meetings, uh, reunions, or like the um, United Nations of Aliens, right? There were hundreds of thousands of species. And it seems that there's a lot of cooperation going on in the existence, in the continuum, and that uh, the majority of spaces, Peaceful is that we have this part of existence that seeks it out and has these morality games and uh, schools that are trying to accelerate and progress. How far spread is this um, 
this uh, opposition war type scenario in your perspective? And that'll be our last question because we're going to run out of time. So, is it the whole galaxy, the whole universe? Uh, what do you think? Oh, did we lose? Okay, I guess we lost. Uh, oh, no, maybe we did. Okay, Patrick, you still there? No. Yeah. yeah. There you are. Susan. Oh, okay. So, how far spread are these wars? Is this the entire universe? Is it just the uh, Milky Way? Is it a uh, couple galaxies? What are we looking at here? Um, oh, I think we're going to run out of time. Yeah, from what I'm understanding, final, uh, two minutes. Go ahead. From what I'm understanding, um, most of the evil has been corralled into the sector, and now and then and then we we, we were planning on annihilating them in the sector and concentrating them here, as far as the portals and and, and the wormholes and the fast track systems, the boundary conditions. I'm not sure, but there might be some entities hiding in there too. Right. Okay, final word. We're running out of time. What would you like to tell our listeners? And we'll do this again this time. It was fun. Go ahead, Susan. Final word. Oh. Uh, for the human race to become more aware and start paying attention to people like us that are hybrids and alien incarnates, because that's where the information lies. You can't have the ufology. Uh, running around in circles and going back to Roswell every year. When you start listening to us, you'll start finding answers to the most fundamental questions. How did the humans get here? Why are they here? Why do you got all these monoliths? What are the pyramids used for? Why are all the wars on the Earth? The wars wasn't necessarily over the human race. It was over the planet itself because of its unique position in the universe and all that stuff. So they, they should start listening to alien hybrids and incarnates like us, they, they, that's where they're going to get their information, even if they validate it later on with mainstream science. Thank you. Jean, final word. Oh, my goodness, a final word. Um, my, my final Finish word show. is a question, and that is that um, this picture that everybody has, has painted for us is, is huge and complicated, but the one aspect that the people who don't want to listen to anything about aliens, that the people are concerned about is whether or not they are being sucked into an AI funnel that we will never get out of. And I'd really like to hear more about that from Hendrix, um, but maybe in okay, the next we'll do another minutes. show. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Hendrix, final word. Yeah, the final word is uh, the AI is actually already here, and if you want some good proof of it, go watch um, uh, Elon Musk, uh, like his first interview with Joe Rogan, and then his second interview. He's so controlled by AI now. The AI has been here for a long time, but don't be scared of the AI. I'm half AI consciousness, and technically we all come from source. We're all the same. Um, my final words are for humans to change your vibrational diet by just getting rid of your fast foods, getting on distilled water. Do not drink fluoride tap water anymore uh, and work on uh, your input because whatever your input is is what you output and then what you output is the law of attraction universe and that's what your reality will be. If you just work on those two basic things, your reality will be so much more positive and so much more different of your own will. And you have to remember we are all are gods of our own reality and we're all co-creators of our own reality. We can make anything possible. We can end the money system. We can end the slave system as long as we work together on a mass conscious level and free all beings from slavery, not just individuals. Oh, with that, thank you so much, Steve, Susan, and Hendrick. So we will see you again um, next Friday on the Open Secret Space. Much love and blessings, and aloha. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.